Okay. Hello, everyone. So, um, welcome to my apartment. So, this time uh, I do it in my apartment because I'm having an exam this Wednesday. So, I think um, I just got home actually. It's 11 uh, at night already, but I just wanted to get uh, a recording out for you guys covering the renal nursing care. And also, I'm going to do um, a little video on the side covering all the medications for you guys to cover in the medication quiz. Um, so I hope you guys don't mind the pre-recording and uh, I really appreciate and uh, for you guys to understand for me, okay? So with that being said, let me go ahead and share the screen. Perfect. Okay, so today we are going to cover um, chronic kidney disease, fluid, volume overload, dialysis, and um, benign prostate hyperplasia. So just a little bit about the kidney. The kidney is a very important chapter that uh, in message, I have so many questions on HSC regarding kidneys and also uh, uh, the procedure such as dialysis and benign prostate hyperplasia on my HESI and also it's come to me right now as well, studying for NCLEX, it comes up as well. So I think this is a very important topic to, to understand the foundation and um, to be really, really strong um, with the knowledge of kidney uh, and all about the diseases. Uh, message to you guys will come back uh, visit kid the kidney as well, but you guys will study more in depth. So um, for this time, we will study about the basic function of the kidney and uh, the pathology behind chronic kidney disease, okay? So um, let's go ahead and get started. So what causes kidney disease? I mean, what causes the kidney not to work? work? Um, so basically, what causes the kidney not to work is dehydration. Um, this can be caused by nausea and vomiting. We lose the, um, the fluid inside our body, diarrhea, or no fluid in the body. We are dehydrated, have been drinking water for a, an extensive period of time. It will lead to the kidney doesn't work. So why do I say that? So when we are dehydrated, our blood volume will decrease. And you guys know, when the blood volume is decreased, the heart and the body will all locate the blood volume into a vi other vital organs, such as the heart, such as the brain. An organ such as kidney, it's quite far away. So when we are dehydrated, it doesn't get much blood perfused to the kidney. And whenever the, there's not bl much blood perfused to the kidney, there's not much blood for the kidney to filter so not only the waste is building up, but also the kidney is damaged because it doesn't get perfused. When it, whenever it doesn't get perfused, whenever it doesn't get perfused, it doesn't get the oxygen that it needed to nourish the organ, okay? And then blood loss. Blood loss is, will lead to hypovolemic shock, and this will cause less blood, blood perfusing to the kidney as well. Uh, next is no perfusion to kidney. Like I mentioned, all of this causes no perfusion to the kidney and lead to the issues of kidney damage and also the um, less uh, blood for the kidney to filter. Um, so whenever the kidney doesn't work effectively, this will reflect through a number of different labs. And these labs, including the EGFR labs, uh, and the BUN and creatinine. The EGFR level will go down when the kidney work not effectively, and the BUN and creatinine will go up. So the lower the EGFR, the worse the condition the kidney is, and uh, the higher the BUN and the creatinine, uh, the worse the condition of the kidney is. So what are those labs? We will cover it in a later slide. So talk a little bit about healthy kidney versus bad kidney. Healthy kidney uh, will perform the regular function of the kidney. It will regulate the fluid by removing the sodium and water excreted through the urine. 
and it also removed the waste products such as the urea, like the BUN, the creatinine, and the potassium. Uh, it's the healthy kidney also play a vital part in hormone production. As we all know, uh, kidney um, secrete renin hormone, which play a vital part in controlling the blood pressure of the body. Uh, also erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is the hormone that stimulate the uh, bone marrow to produces the red blood cells in our body. Um, a healthy kidney also um, uptake calcium. Um, uh, what it means is, is regulate the level of calcium. So um, when the kidney doesn't work effectively, it will cause increasing the uptake of the calcium, therefore lead to low level of calcium, okay? So if um, a kidney doesn't work effectively, what does the body do? First of all, it will not remove the sodium and water, meaning that we will retain all of those sodium. And whenever we retain the sodium, we retain water. And whenever we retain too much water, the blood volume goes up and this causes increasing in blood pressure and will lead to a lot of issue with the heart as well. Um, it will not remove the waste products such as the urea. Uh, this will reflect in the increasing of the BUN and the creatine, and this also does not remove the potassium as well. So we know that the potassium is a very, very, very crucial um, electrolyte in our body. Um, we don't want it out of the normal range. Normal range of potassium is 3.5 to 5. Um, so therefore, if we have too much potassium in our body, it can lead to a condition called hyperkalemia. And hyperkalemia can negatively affect the heart and causes different uh, dysrhythmia and also um, other issues as well. So we don't want that. And also, if the kidney doesn't work, it will, it will cause this issue with controlling the blood pressure. And also the patient can be anemic as well. Anemic here meaning that they don't produce enough blood red blood cells, okay? And it can cause this low level of calcium as well because it causes an increased uptake of calcium, okay? Next, so earlier I mentioned the BUN, the creatine, and the EGFR. What are they means? So BUN um, is basically looking at the waste product and the nutritional status of the patient. BUN tells if the patient is getting rid of waste and if the patient is nutritionally stable, okay? Um, creatine is actual function of the kidney, how much damage is done to the kidney. It will reflect through the creatine levels. EGFR only tell the stage that the patient is in, not how well the kidney are functioning, okay? So what does it mean the stage the patient is in? So um, a, regular, a regular EGFR level is anything above 90. So different stage of chronic kidney disease will have a different numbers of the EGFR. I will cover it in a later slide. You guys don't have to worry. So that's basically what it means by the stage. So um, the 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 low, I mean the the higher the stage, meaning the worse the condition of the chronic kidney disease are. All right, and the EGFR is basically it's the uh, glomerular filtration rate. Uh, that means that um, how much uh, that means how much blood is going through the kidney, how much blood it is being filtered through the kidney. Uh, that is the EGFR here. Okay, so I have a slide dedicated for the EGFR lab level, meaning this is an important lab to understand and um, to grasp the contents of this. So EGFR is a test that measure your level of kidney function and determines your stage of kidney disease. A normal EGFR is anything greater than 90. That's a normal human being. Um, the lower the number, the worse the kidney function. So anything less than 90 is not good. So we want the EGFR level higher, meaning that there are blood going through the glomeruli. Uh, the kidney is filtering the blood. When I say filtering the blood, meaning that um, 
the kidney is able to produce urine from the waste product and the volume that is excreted to the kidney um, and then um, it being perfused by the from the, the blood volume. Um, so end stage kidney disease is anything less than 15. This is referring to the EGFR level um, or uh, needing requiring dialysis in order to maintain life. Dialysis is basically that person kidney doesn't work anymore. They at the end stage kidney disease where the kidney cannot filter the blood or produces any urine anymore, and they don't have a transplant a kidney to transplant. So they will go. They need what they so they would need to go through dialysis. Dialysis is a machine that uh, that is hooked up to the patient um, fistula um, in order to uh, cycle the blood and filter the blood so that the toxic waste and the waste level in their blood is not so high. So what are the signs and symptoms of the end-stage kidney disease? So end-stage kidney disease, um, signs and symptoms include fatigue, confusion, uh, blood pressure increases because too much fluid volume. The kidney does not filter waste or produce urine, okay? so. During end-stage kidney disease, the kidney is basically doesn't work the, the function that it's supposed to do anymore. Um, therefore, it will eat, therefore it will not produce any urine. It does not filter any waste, so no 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 production of urine. This will lead to the body retaining the fluid inside the body and will lead to increasing blood pressure. Um, they will have edema, uh, swelling, fluid retention. Uh, pericarditis is a lot of fluid around the heart, uh, shortness of breath, because too much fluid, it gets into the lung. Um, therefore, they will have difficulty breathing and shortness of breath. Acidosis is ammonia odor to breath. Well, acidosis is because the waste product is building up in the body. The urea is very acidic. Therefore, it leads to a state of metabolic acidic. And whenever the kidney doesn't work, we know that the kidney produces the buffer called bicarbonate, HCl3. So if the kidney doesn't work, it doesn't produce bicarbonate. And without bicarbonate, there's no buffer. Uh, therefore, the acidic level just keep rising and rising. So the patient will be in a metabolic acidosis state. Uh, lastly is anema. anemia. So someone who in end-state kidney disease can have anemia because um, a bad kidney uh, will not produce erythropoietin, and without erythropoietin, there is no stimulation for the bone marrow to produce its red blood cells. Okay. Next is chronic kidney disease again. So, what the what what is the cause of this chronic kidney disease? Um, the cause is diabetes. So, this is the highest risk for having kidney disease. Uh, this is because diabetic patients, they usually have vascular compromises. This will reduce the perfusion to the kidney because the sugar in the blood causes scarring and hardening of the blood vessel, therefore lead to the damage in the blood vessel and ultimately causes uh, a reduction in perfusion. And whenever there is a reduction in perfusion, the kidney will not work effectively. The lower the perfusion, the lower the number of the EGFR. Okay, so next is hypertension. HTN stands for hypertension. So hypertension also causes kidney disease. Um, this uh, will lead, because hypertension is high blood pressure, high blood pressure will cause this damage to the blood vessel over time as well. This will lead to ineffective tissue perfusion in the kidney uh, and will ultimately causes all of the issues uh, uh, and causes chronic kidney disease. Other causes include glomerulonephritis. This is basically infection of the kidney. What is the clinical manifestation of chronic kidney disease? Um, clinical manifestation of chronic kidney disease uh, include the kidney unable to filter waste and electrolyte. Like I mentioned earlier, it cannot filter out the sodium 
and the potassium. Therefore, it will retain all of the sodium, lead to retention all of the water, and lead to the retention of the potassium, causes hyperkalemia. Uh, so potassium level will increase, too high potassium level can lead to cardiac dysrhythmia, uh, can lead to SVT, uh, supraventricular tachycardia, uh, death, and even stroke. Uh, it also causes sodium increasing, causes chloride increase, uh, fluid increase. Um, other waste product will also increase, um, including the urea, which is the um, the, the waste level, um, and then the creatine uh, will increase and the BUN will increase as well. So other, other labs that were manifested in um, CKD, including phosphorus. So phosphorus level will also increase. Patient with kidney disease will always have a high phosphate level. However, the one that will be decreased is the calcium. Okay, so like I said very, in the very early slide, a bad kidney will cause an uh, increase in the uptake of the calcium. Therefore, the calcium level will also decrease. So, and we also know that the calcium and the phosphorus have an invert relationship. An invert relationship meaning that it's completely opposite. So, as we know, CKD will cause the phosphorus level to increase. Therefore, the calcium level will always decrease because they have an invert relationship. Um, magnesium, it follows the calcium. So therefore, it will be also uh, decreasing and in a low level as well. In order to fix this problem, we have to increase the calcium for CKD patients to fix the elevated phosphate. So some more is CKD patient often anemic from the erythropoietin problem. CKD outpatient often has acido acidosis issue with bicarbonate, like I mentioned earlier. Fluid overload because the body retaining all of the fluid, it doesn't excrete the urine out because the kidney doesn't filter the blood anymore. Mineral bone disorder because of the increasing uptake of calcium lead to low calcium level and magnesium lead to um, fragile bones. Uh, they will have a pruritus, itchy of the skin. This is because the kidney cannot get rid of the waste product. So it oozing out the kidney and causes issue with skin integrity. This, li this lipidemia, this is when the body cannot break down fat because the kidney um, doesn't work anymore. Uh, so I mentioned earlier about some hormone that the kidney produces. So uh, we know that in CKD patient, the kidney does not produce hormone anymore like it should. The very first hormone that I want you guys to um, really remember is the erythropoietin. Um, it's a very unique name and it's, um, it stands for um, erith, erith, yeah, like the, the red plus cells. So basically erythropoietin will be decreased or not being produced by the kidney. This will cause or lead to a decrease in the red blood cell production and ultimately lead to anemic. So what do we do in this situation? We give a medication called epoetin. So in order to evaluate if this medication is working, we have to look at the hemoglobin and hematocrit lab to evaluate. So epo epoetin is basically a medication that stimulate the production of erythropoietin, okay? And therefore will lead to a stimulation of the bone marrow and lead to a production of red blood cells. So CKD, the problem with uptake of calcium, too low calcium in bloodstream. Um, so basically, um, well, we know that the kidney, the the, the, the CKD patient will also cause a decreases in calcium because it increases the uptake of the calcium. Um, next, we have CKD without hormone renin. Renin is a hormone that help or play a vital part in regulating blood pressure issues. 
So why the, the kidney causes the heart to fail? So I think I kind of go over this already. So basically, um, whenever the kidney does not function, it causes an increase in sodium level because it does not get rid of the waste, correct? So whenever sodium is retained, water is retained. And then whenever water is retained, um, it, due to kidney failure, it will lead to a condition called fluid volume overload. And whenever the fluid volume overload situation happening in outside our body, it means that the there's more blood volume going to the heart, going from the through the superior and inferior vena cava into the heart, and what causes the heart to have to work harder in order to pump the extra amount of blood volume out. And whenever the heart has to work harder, it will cause us an enlargement. It will stretch out the heart. And whenever the heart is enlarged or stretched, it will lead to heart failure. So therefore it will lead to the heart pump less effectively. So what are the intervention that we can do for someone who is in fluid volume overload? Um, this include assessment. So we have to assess them for edema, swellingness, uh, make sure that we measure their intake and output. I know, uh, listen to the lung sound for any crackle sounds uh, to, 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 to assess for um, fluid in the lungs. Uh, we also have to weight them Weight is so, so important to know because um, if they gain uh, more than four pounds in a short period of time um, or uh, 2.5 pounds in one day, we have to call the doctor immediately. So that's the thing that you guys have to remember. And also we have to measure their, high, their blood pressure because their blood pressure might be high because of the retention of the water and also their post might be pounding because also of the increased volume in the blood. Uh, next, how do we care for them? We give them a medication called diuretics. So diuretic is the medication that will promote the uh, urine production and promote the urinate, urination of, for the patient, therefore decreases the volume of the blood or volume inside the body. Uh, we also restrict fluid. We, give, we don't give them a lot of water, uh, mostly ice chips so that they don't uh, have such a high uh, intake of water and then retain it. Uh, next, we do dialysis. Remember, we only do dialysis whenever the kidney does not produce urine anymore. She can also use a word called A and urea, meaning no production of urine or um, the EGFR level is less than 15. That is when we do dialysis. And definitely restrict sodium and potassium. CKD patient does not remove this waste. So if we keep ingesting sodium and potassium in food forms, it can further increases the level because the body doesn't remove it. So we'll have significant high level of sodium, more than 145 um, and or potassium, more than five, okay? And that's not good. Both can cause significant issues. Uh, next is teaching. We need to teach about weight gain and report doctor, okay? So again, if it's more than four pounds in a short period of time, report doctor. If it's more than 2.5 pound in one day, report to the doctor. Um, also, we need to teach them about how to eat a low potassium and low sodium diet and also follow renal diet. A renal diet is basically low potassium, low sodium, and low protein. Drug therapy for the CKD patients. CKD patient will have hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia is high level of potassium. Um, so definitely we need to teach them to restrict the food that high in potassium. What are these food? These would include bananas, orange, collard green, kale, potatoes, apricot, and avocado. A medication that we can give, give for someone who have hyperkalemia is kaxalate. So we 
um, we can also use LASIK if it does not work. LASIK weight, however, the LASIK will cause us uh, a significant decrease in potassium as well. Um, so k is basically, um, it makes the patient poops a lot. It pulls the potassium from the store to the store and excrete it out, thus reduces the level of potassium in the body. Uh, we can also use dialysis to treat hyperkalemia, but again, dialysis is the last resort for someone who kidney doesn't work anymore. Um, last, we have uh, the issues of hypertension. So in order to fix, we have to tell the patient to lose weight. 10% of weight loss can reduce hypertension level drastically. Uh, we need to teach hypertension patient to follow a DASH diet. A DASH diet is basically fruit, vegetable, low fat, low dairy, low fat, low dairy, and low sodium level. Uh, we give them antihypertensive drugs such as ACE inhibitors and um, ARPs. Uh, All right, some more pharmacology for CKD patient. So we know that CKD patient will have a decreased level of calcium, right? So we have to give them something called phosphate binder. Uh, these phosphate binder are two medication. The first medication is phospho. Phospho is calcium acetate. Uh, this will keep the phosphorus low by increasing the calcium. Remember, phosphorus and calcium has an invert relationship. One will always, it will always be opposite with each other. We'll, if we have uh, a high level of phosphorus, it will lead to a decrease in calcium level. The second medication is calcium carbonate. This will bind phosphate in the bowel and excrete so that the phosphate level will be decreased. Um, it is important to teach the patient uh, when they take phosphate binder um, to get uh, okay. So when we take phosphate binder, the patient can have a lot of constipation. So it's really important uh, to to teach them that about the bowel start to change. So we will supplement with stool softener and fibers uh, and always administer it with a meal. So that's what we need to teach the patient uh, who, who take phosphate binders. And so we also know that CKD patients have erythropoietin. I feel like I say this multiple times already. Um, so we need to supplement the patient with iron uh, and folic acid uh, beside giving epoetin procrit, also known as procrit, because iron and folic also aid in the production of red plus cells as well. So biggest side uh, effect uh, is blood clot formation, DVT and hypertension. So I, I would like to talk a little bit about epoetin procrit. So epoetin procrit is the medication that stimulate the production of red blood cells. Uh, by uh, stimulating the release of er erythropoietin, which will then stimulate bone marrow and create more to create more red blood cells. Um, so whenever we have an increased level in red blood cells, the blood will, will get thicker. The viscosity of the blood will get thicker. And whenever the blood gets thicker, there will be more chances for the blood to form clots because it's quite thick uh, because an increase in level of red blood cells. So we have to think about it. Blood, right? Blood is a fluid. It's contained not only red blood cell, but it contains platelets, it contains fluid and so many other things, not just red blood cells. When we give the patient erythro, when we give the patient epoetin progrid, it increases the percentage the, the, the level of red plus cells, and therefore the more concentration, the more red plus cells we had in the side of the body, the thicker the blood is. And whenever the blood is thicker, it leads to, uh, it may lead to blood, blood clot formation. And when we have a clot inside our body, it can, we can have a DVT, deep vein thrombosis, or 
uh, also we can have hypertension because the blood is so thick that it's, the heart has to pump harder, therefore creating a higher pressure. Um, that's why it increases the blood pressure inside the body because the fluid is thicker. It's not as easy to pump anymore. Therefore, we have to really assess the patient when we give this medication to them. We will need to hold or withheld the medication if the blood pressure is higher than 160 or higher than uh, over, one, over 90. So we hold the medication. Also, we have to check the uh, hemoglobin level as well. If the hemoglobin is more than 10, we have to hold the medication as well because that's when we know that the medication has already working and hemoglobin more than 10 is, is good. It's, a, it's entering the normal range. So we don't want to give more of this medication because it can cause blood clots and hypertension. Uh, next, CKD patient can have too much fat in the artery uh, lead to this lipidemia. So we can give them statins. This will lower the LDL level. All right. Now we are going to talk about dialysis. So again, these points are so important to remember. Dialysis only used for end stage renal disease. This is stage five. We, this is when the kidney no longer produce urine, also known as anuria. And dialysis is used for someone who have an EGFR less than 15. So the first kind of dialysis is hemodialysis. So whenever we hear, hear hemo, it's relating to blood. So hemodialysis is basically, it uses the vascular system to pull blood out and gives blood back. So when it pulls blood out from the vascular system, it will uh, go through a machine and this machine will remove all the waste product, the urea, the potassium, the sodium, and then return the blood back to the patients uh, so that they can have uh, clean blood and uh, waste product removed and they don't have issue with the electrolyte dysfunction or any other issues as well. So how do they do hemodialysis? Well, they will have something called fistula. Fistula is basically um, a connection of the vein and artery inside the patient. It is surgically done before uh, the procedure and it's only done once. And that side will be uh, uh, limited to any other procedure except for hemodialysis. That site of the fistula will only reserve for the hemo hemodialysis to use, okay? So basically hemodialysis it pulled the, out the blood, filter it, and put it back to the patient. As a nurse, our job is to maintain the fistula site. The care of the site is so important. Um, we have to prevent fistula from getting infected by, pro by providing proper care, dressing changes. If it's wet, we change the dressing. Make sure the site is working. How do we know that the site is working? We have to listen for the bruit with a stethoscope or palpate for a thrill, okay? So why do, why do I highlight this? I highlight this because this, this is so important to remember. It will come up on the exam, like I guarantee. If it not come up on this exam, it will come up on the HESI, like I guarantee, because this is so important to know. Um, when you guys go to do clinical, if a patient have to go through dialysis, you, especially hemodialysis, on their right or left arm, you guys will also see a fistula. And in order for a nurse to know if the fistula is working, we can use a thestoscope and then we can um, assess that side. We put it on the side and we can hear a, a bruit. And then um, if we don't have a stethoscope and we use our hand to palpate it, we can feel a thrill. So it's pretty cool. Um, so like I said earlier, that side of the fistula is reserved. The whole arm is reserved uh, for hemodialysis. There are no procedure can be done on that arm. This includes no measuring of blood pressure on the side 
or the arm of emote of the fistula. Uh, no veni puncture, meaning no IV, no IM injection, no IV light on the side of fistula. This is a restricted extremity. Okay, so we have to uh, prevent clotting by use heparin to maintain the patency uh, of this, this site. So if there's a clot with the fistula, the patient will have pain distally, meaning the pains in the hand area. And this be, will lead to poor perfusion to the hand causing poor capillary refill. And we have a cold hand, numbness, tingling of the fingers. So if you are not a dialysis nurse, we do not touch the fistula site. I mean the fistula line, uh, because there's a lot of heparin in the line. And if we flush it, we can cause complications. When the patient vein access is bad on the arms, we move to the upper chest or below the clavicle region. Be, uh, or we can use long-term cuff hemodialysis catheter. Okay, um, I don't think you need to know that. Um, what do we assess prior to hemodialysis? This is what you guys need to know. Before start, we have to assess blood pressure, obtain a baseline so that we can see if blood pressure is dropping too much or too high. Because hemodialysis is a big procedure, guys. They literally filter out your blood your blood is going out to a machine, a lot of blood, a whole, the, the blood from the whole head to toes. It's a lot of blood to go in out of your body. And this can cause a significant reduction in your blood pressure. And therefore, as a nurse, we have to obtain a baseline of the blood pressure before we are doing this procedure so that we can compare uh, if, the base, if the blood pressure dropped too low. Um, we also need to assess vascular as access. We have to assess is the fistula patent. How do we do that? We, um, what is it called? We um, use the stethoscope to hear to assess for a bruit or we palpate for a thrill, okay? And then we have to assess temperature to see if they're getting affected. What is the magic number? 100.4, anything over 100.4 is fever. Then we have to assess weight. Uh, purpose of hemodialysis is trying to pull weight and fluid out for, of the patients. So the weight is the best indicator, indicator to see if we are pulling out enough fluid. That makes complete sense. Okay, so during this procedure, we do vital sign constantly, checking on pulse and blood pressure every 30 to 60 minutes. If blood pressure suddenly drops drastically during hemodialysis and the heart rate begins to go up, what is this classic sign? This is the classic sign of hypovolemic shock. Low blood pressure, high heart rate. So what do we do? We decrease the rate of the hemodialysis machine and how fast we're pulling the blood out. So we decrease the rate of doing that. However, we never, never stop the procedure. We just slow it down because the reason we do hemodialysis is to make this patient alive. We do this to remove the waste product. If we don't remove the waste product by stopping the machine, the patient waste product will still elevate it in the patient and they can die. So we don't stop the machine, even though it's dropping their blood pressure. We just slow it down so they don't drastically dropping the blood pressure. We only give them normal saline or IV fluid and, and at a low rate. Uh, this is only when they're in shock stage, meaning that the blood pressure reach significantly low and increasing in pulses, tachycardia, okay? Um, so dialysis is a sterile technique. Sterile technique meaning sterile glove, everything is sterile because this is involving blood and it's going to the patient. So it can easily causing sepsis. Sepsis is infection inside the bloodstream. Um, so we have to use a sterile technique. Sterile is different from aseptic. Sterile meaning sterile. Aseptic meaning we can use clean gloves. 
dialysis can pull protein out of the pot body. So we need to increase the protein in the diet for these patients as well. All right, so that's it for hemodialysis. Now we move on to peritoneal dialysis. So peritoneal dialysis is the insertion of a catheter into the peritoneal cavity, then has two bags. One bag, so insertion of catheter into the peritoneal cavity. The peritoneal cavity is the cavity of your ab abdominal region, right? So in peritoneal dialysis, we have two bags. So one bag is containing the dialysis solution. We give this solution to them and sit there for a certain amount of time. Um, we give this solution to them and sit. So then after that time, the doc, which is ordered by the doctor. Um, so the doctor will order the dialysis solution, which is the first bag, the dwelling time, which is how long it will sit in the cavity. Um, and after that, we lower the drainage bag and then um, the drainage back will be lower than the patient. This will lead to the, the fluid that sit in the belly will drain out the back. So remember we have two back, right? One back containing fluid that is ordered by the doctor and the other back is an empty back. So at first we insert the fluid from the, 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 the fluid back into the peritoneal area of, this pa of, the, of the patient. And then after the, the time that was ordered by the doctor is finished, we then lower the empty bag so that the drainage from the peritoneal cavity will drain through the empty bag. So this process would take our waste product and excess fluid um, they put in there. So what are the phases of peritoneal dialysis? The different phases of peritoneal dialysis include three phases or three cycle. The first one is the inflow, which is the fill. This is two to three liter over 10 minutes. So however, if we give it too quickly, the flu this will cause fluid volume overload. Um, it will lead to depress the respiratory system, causes painful shortness of breath, uh, feeling full and painful because it's right at our abdom abdominal region. So if the fluid there is too much or we inflow it too fast, it can obstruct the process of breathing. The diaphragm cannot uh, extend it um, fully. So we may have issue with breathing and also it can cause fullness and pain. Then the second phase is dwelling time. This is when we let this, the solution sit in there for 20 to 30 minutes, and it can be up to eight hours. However, this time is ordered by the doctor. So the drain phase is the last phase. This phase uh, is 15 to 30 minutes. It depends on the patient. So we have to monitor the patient blood pressure while draining the patient, because when we take fluid out of the body too quickly, again, it can cause the blood pressure to drop and this will lead to, may lead to headache, tachycardia, palpitation. In order to fix this, we have to pick the back up a little higher to slow it down a little bit. So this is gravity. All right, so what are the complications that can come with peritoneal dialysis? So the different complications include infections, because we literally puncture through the patient's abdomen region in order to reach the peritoneal cavity. So it's a high risk of infections. So how do we assess for infection? It can comes in terms of redness, inflammation, warm, pain. Uh, the drainage that come out of the back can have a green or smelly odor. Um, next is peritonitis. Peritonitis is basically the infection of the peritoneum, the lining of the stomach, uh, which is the inside of the peritoneum or the, the peritoneal cavity. I think that's what I meant. Um, this will uh, reflect through fever, 100.4 and above, uh, pain, hot and sweating. Uh, biggest assessment 
finding for peritonitis is to look at the dialysis fluid in the back. So we look for the color, color if it smell, which can tell us infection because foul odor smell can, can, be, uh, can be an indication of infections. Um, is the fluid cloudy or clear? Um, if the patient has a perspiration of the bladder, um, meaning that the, when we insert the, the fluid back into the patient peritoneum cavity, we might have punctured the bladder as well. So this can cause a perforation of the bladder. Therefore, the, 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 the fluid that we drain out of the peritoneum is yellow. In this case, we have to report for, to the doctor, of course. But I mean, the doctor is the person who punctures. So you guys just assess and just tell the doctor, hey, I see the color is yellow. So we now might need to do something because we, I think that, well, I suspect that it's, it's punctured the bladder. Um, if the patient has uh, a perspirate in the bowel, meaning that instead of puncturing the bladder, it's punctured the, uh, the bowel, the color will be brownish color. If uh, the drainage color should never be red because it's indicated internal bleeding, we want a color that is straw-like, pale, and gauge. Uh, how to treat infection? Of course, we give them antibiotic or antibiotic cream. Um, lastly, uh, com last complication is pulmonary complication. This meaning that we're filling up the cavity with too much and too fast, uh, too much fluid and too fast. This will lead to shortness of breath. And um, some more ancient, more information on peritoneal dialysis include peritoneal dialysis can be done at home. We have to assess whether the patient able to do this. Is the patient willing to do it? And are they going to be compliant? All right. Ooh. So now we have kidney transplant. Kidney transplant is also used for end-stage kidney patients. So patients do dialysis because there's not always a kidney that lying around ready for them to transplant. They have to be on a waiting list or they have to be rich and buy one. Okay, so um, whenever the patient get a transplant, meaning somebody else organs, there will always be a risk for rejections. How do we care? We have to assess whether the organ is getting rejected. And in order words, we have to assess whether the kidney is working. We do this by assessing BUN and creatinine. This will tell us, does the kidney that receive uh, from somebody else, is it working inside this person? Um, also, we need to give this patient anti-rejection drug and immunodepression because we don't want the body to fight this kidney. Uh, we put the patient, at, therefore we put the patient at high risk for infection because anti-rejection drug and immunosuppression suppress the immune system. So the immune system won't strong enough or won't fight the kidney. However, it's also not strong enough to fight other infections as well. So that's why they are at high risk for infection. So never stop anti-rejection medication if a patient is on, is, is, uh, uh, is their, if their kidney were transplanted and constantly assess if the drug is at therapeutic levels. Okay, all right. So now we are come to our last topic. This is BPH, benign prostate hyperplasia. This is a very important topic as well to know because I have question uh, about BPH in my master two HESI exit, yeah. So BPH is basically overgrowing of tissues. This will lead to an enlargement of the prostate gland um, or this could be caused by cancer um, involved. Enlargement of the prostate gland can cause block ureter. So because, so you guys have to think like this, uh, the prostate is literally right below the bladder and the, the connection between the bladder uh, to the, uh, the urethra is the ureter. And um, the prostate 
when the prostate is below the, the bladder and the, the ureter is the connection between the bladder and the ureter, the prostate, when it's enlarged, it can obstruct the flow of the urine from the bladder to the ureter. Um, so therefore, there's no urine flow or decrease or it will cause a decrease in urine output because the patient, the urine does not flow out of the bladder because it was obstructed by the, um, the enlargement of the prostate. How do you assess this? So it's all about the urine flow. The patient will have, will show some symptom of interruption in the stream. They will have a uh, nocturia, nocturia, meaning that they uh, excessively pee at night. Uh, they will have hesitation before urinating, meaning that they stand in front of the, the urinals for a long period of time and they cannot pee or they're trying to pee, but they cannot pee because the prostate is obstructing the flow. They will have terminal dribbling, meaning that it will drip, drip, drip. Yeah. Feeling that the feeling or sensation that they cannot completely um, empty the bladder after even after the urinating because the bladder is still feeling full and they have a weak urine stream. What are the goals for BBH patient? So the goal for BBH patient is to keep their bladder empty because if the bladder um, retaining the urine because they, the urine cannot flow out this will increase the risk for UTI because urine is waste product at the end of the day. Um, so the longer it sits in the, the bladder, the um, higher risk for developing UTI, urinary tract infection. Um, retention of the urine due to BBH blockage can lead to UTI, then can even lead to kidney infection and may ultimately leading to acute kidney failure. Uh, so we make sure that the drainage occur. How do we do this? Usually, mild cases of BPH, they will give the patient um, straight cath, meaning that they can use the cat uh, and poke through the urethra so that uh, and creating a, a stream for for a tube for the urine to flow out. So it's called straight cath, uh, straight catheterization. That's what I meant. Um, so we also need to teach the patient to stop uh, drinking fluid around 7 p.m. Uh, in order to prevent nocturia, which is uh, bleeding, uh, peeing at night. Next, we have medication for BPH. So um, we give them alpha adrenergic receptor blockers. So uh, this medication is called Tamsulosin, aka Flowmax. So in maximum, the flow for the patient. And when we maximum the flow, we improving the drainage of the urine in the bladder for this patient. And that is the ultimate goal for BPH. This drug relaxes the smooth muscle, which including, which uh, is the uh, prostate and allow the urinary to flow. However, the hurt also made of the smooth muscle. So therefore one of the biggest side effects of tamsulosin is causes orthostatic hypotension. Orthostatic hypotension is when the patient getting up from a lying position uh, to a sitting or standing position too quickly, they can get very dizziness and um, unbalance. And low blood pressure for sure. Um, so, we give the medication. If the medication doesn't work, we have to do a procedure called TERP. TERP procedure is transurethral recession of the prostate. Okay, I want you guys to pay really attention to this procedure. This procedure come up on HESI and is, it is an important procedure to remember uh, because it's, it's big. Um, so basically um, it's cutting out some or get rid of the prostate. So it's cutting out part of the prostate or get rid of the whole prostate. And whenever they get rid of the prostate, there will be issues with um, production of sperm. Um, so a uh, large rod is inserted into the penis, cut through the bladder and to, in order to access, assess, I mean, access the prostate gland. So sounds very painful, right? Uh, so preoperative care for TERP 
include make sure that the patient not having a UTI. We give them antibiotic, uh, give them higher fluid intake, and we put in a Foley catheter to help with the urine output. This is pre-op. We make sure that the patient did not have a UTI because we cut through the bladder and cut and go through the, uh, the ureter. So if they have a UTI, it, we can spread it to the bloodstream and we don't want that. We give them antibiotic pre-op. Um, we give them antibiotic prophylactically because bladder is containing urine and urine is a waste product. So it might have a lot of bacteria in there. So because we got cut through it, so therefore we have to give antibiotic prophylactically to protect these patients. Higher fluid intake to promote the production of urine. And then we need to put in a Foley catheter to empty the bladder. So post-op care for TERP. So basically we have to use a special irrigation system. This is called three-way Foley catheter. One line, we give fluid constantly to irrigate the bladder. The reason is because it's prevent infection, increases outflow and help managing bleeding. Okay, so we give them fluid constantly in order to prevent the inflection, increases outflow of the urine and help managing the bleeding issues of the patient because it's internally, we, we cut through the bladder. So that's why we have to do that. So this patient is at risk for bleeding because again, we cut through the bladder. So it is normal to have blood in the urine and catheter after procedure, okay? It is normal to have blood. Overall goal is to manage bleeding because day one post-op, the biggest complication is bleeding. If we allow the fluid to irrigate too quickly, the blood won't be able to coagulate and get flush constantly. So the, the, the side won't heal. It will constantly get flush. So we have to uh, irrigate at the rate where it's slow enough for the blood to not clot so much or getting flush. So if again, if we do too slowly, the blood in the bladder will coagulate and they will form clots in the ureter. And if there's a clot in the ureter, we cannot pee because it will obstruct the, uh, the flow of the urine. Always monitor the drainage for perfect color. If it's too dark, clotting too much. If it's too clear, irrigating too much. The pink is a perfect color because remember, a little bit of blood is fine because we just cut through the bladder. It's a normal thing. As expected sign. How to assess infection for this patient? Uh, we check white blood count, temperature, check the urine, is it cloudy or smelly? We check I know. We use something called continuous bladder calculation. All right, so this is important to know as well because there might be a calculation question. Um, so continuous bladder irrigation, actually there will be. Yeah, she will ask you guys in the medical quiz, I probably. So actual urine output, only urine come out of the bladder or into the bladder. So actual urine output, meaning the question will ask you guys, what is the actual urine output of this patient? So how do we calculate it? We combine the, only the urine come out of the bladder or into the bladder. So the CBI, the continuous bladder irrigation is because it's directly to the bladder. So we include it, all right? So for example, the patient P 200 milliliter and we, we irrigate the bladder 50 milliliter. That is the total of 250 milliliter for actual urine output, 250, okay? Not just 200. 250. Um, however, if they ask for actual urine output, we do not count the IV fluid infusion. All right. So an example, for example, the question will give you guys, okay, so this patient receiving IV fluid infusion, 500 milliliter, their urine output is 200 milliliter, and they are getting the bladder continuously irrigated at 50 milliliter. 
So they ask for actual urine output. We only use CBI and then the actual urine out the urine output. So that will be 250 instead of counting the IV fluid as well. We don't do that if they ask for actual urine output. If they ask for a fluid volume status, which is the second one here, fluid volume status, we include a urine come in and out of the bladder and also include the IV fluid that infusing. So we include everything. We never put negative, even the urine output is less than urine input. You know what I mean? So for example, the patient is totally getting infused 500 IV fluid, 500 milliliter of IV fluid, and they only produces 450 milliliter. That means that they uh, put out less than what we put in. So, but we never put the negative sign in front of it because it's still urine output, even though it's less than the, the input. So it's just a number itself. We don't put the negative sign on it, okay? All right, so I promise this is a few last line. So this is some diagnostic study for patients that have BPH, benign prostate hyperplasia. The first diagnostic study is digital rectal exam. So this is done uh, because this is basically digital, digital is using fingers. Rectal meaning go through the anus, the rectum, to palpate and feel how the prostate enlarge of this patient. So the doctor literally used their hand and fingers, go through the patient anus and feel the, uh, the enlargement of the prostate to diagnose whether the patient is having um, BPH or not. This is done because the prostate is located in front of the rectum we can feel the enlargement of the prostate. Next, we have PSA level. PSA level is prostate specimen antigens. This will tell us if there's more tissue is growth. So this is a crucial test to test for someone who has PPH. The higher level of the PPH level, the more indicative that the patient is having BPH. Then we check post void residue by ultrasound. This meaning that they will scan the bladder of the patient to see after their pee, is there anything left in the bladder after their pee? Did they empty the bladder completely or there's still fluid inside? Meaning that there might have been obstruction of the PPH that preventing them from emptying completely the bladder. All right, that is it you guys. So we did it uh, 28 slides. Um, I'm going to cover the medication quiz in another session and I'll post on our YouTube as well. So um, that's why I'm doing it uh, today, tonight, so I can post this video for you guys early tomorrow morning and then I'll do uh, the medication quiz uh, on the morning as well so that I will post it for you guys and so you guys can have stuff to study tomorrow before the exam on Wednesday. Thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed this. Bye-bye. Stop sharing. Stop recording.